Hello everyone, I'm Ted Oakley, Managing Partner here at Oxbow, and I am really excited today to have uh, Pierre Lassonde with us. And Pierre is someone, a man I followed for a long time, he doesn't know that, but uh, he uh, has had an illustrious career. Uh, and in all fairness, uh, we are a shareholder of Franco Nevada, uh, not that we're going to talk about that today, but we're going to talk about gold. But uh, Pierre Lasson, a uh, very interesting man. He uh, obviously was very well educated, uh, had an electrical engineering degree, an MBA, and he started Franco Nevada with a partner in 1982 uh, and sold that 20 years later to Newman, which created a 36% annualized return, uh, to which I would say uh, goodbye Warren Buffett, I suppose. Uh, but that is uh, an incredible track record on his own. He then became president of Newmont Mining, who they sold to in 2002, and uh, was that for a while. And then he and his former group uh, bought the gold, uh, all the gold royalty properties from uh, Newmont and cranked up Franco Nevada again. And I think, uh, I think that's uh, fair to say uh, a great history of, of someone that's done well. But Pierre, you've, you've been around the gold for 40 years now. And uh, my first question would be, where do you think we are now relative to where we were and what do you think we might do in the future? Um, well, thank you, again. thank you again, Ted, for having me. The, uh, I, I look at the situation today very much as shade, I call them shades of the 1970s. And um, I've lived through the 70s, I've lived through um, inflation that went from 2% that was supposed to be transient that did not end up being transient. And it went up to, you know, 4%, 5%, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and interest rate followed right back up, you know, and what happened, both gold and the dollar went up at the same time. All of these went up at the same time. And, um, so if you look at 1976 to 1980, the gold price went from $90 to $800. You had uh, inflation went from 1%, 2% to all the way to 12 13%. And interest rates went up from essentially 3 4% all the way to 16 17%. You had mortgages at 16%. So today we are, to my mind, at the very beginning of this um, cycle. And what's changed everything is the pandemic. The pandemic revealed two major discrepancies in our world. The one is we were applauding all the first line workers saying, you are saving our lives, you're terrific. And these people were getting paid $9 an hour. And all of a sudden it says, why are we doing this for $9 an hour? This is crazy. And they quit. And all of a sudden, Amazon and McDonald's and everything else had to pay them 14, 15, 17, 18, 20 dollars an hour to get them back. And you know what? Salaries don't go back down. Okay. They don't go back down. At the same time, you had a market where the, the Fed dispensed trillions of dollars directly in the pocket of people. So, and they kept interest rate very, very low. They suppressed interest rates. So you look at the real estate market. It's been on fire now for the past two, three years. And we see it in, here in Florida, but you see it everywhere. I'm sure you're seeing it in Austin. It's the same absolutely everywhere. So the, when you look at the CPI, the three major points of the CPI are frankly labor, uh, the imputed rent and energy. And all of these are gonna go up are going up right now, are going to continue to go up. This is not transient. This is going to be a, a three to five year wave, very much like the 1970s, where inflation is going to be between three and 7%. And the Fed will keep interest rates very low at one, 2%, because they're stuck between a, a, hard and a, a rock and a hard place. There's so much debt, they cannot raise interest rate, which then will produce negative real rate of interest, which is the kind of environment that gold absolutely love. So the, but the basis of my forecast is what I've just told you. And I see gold ramping up from where we are today, easily to 2000, but I believe that we're gonna see 24, $2,500 gold 
fairly easily over the next couple of years. And Pierre, if you look at it, uh, you know, 1944 to uh, over the next 15 years, it was similar to that. We were inflating and they kept the rates low. And so it, it killed, you know, it killed the buying power of the dollar and that sort of thing. And um, when you're looking at that in the future like this, this is a question we get a lot. There's three questions that actually came in on this one thing. And that is, uh, could you ask Mitchell Lassan uh, whether you would rather own the bullion or you would rather own the royalty company or the miners outright or some of both? That is a question um, that I love getting. And the answer, to some extent depends on your knowledge of the industry. I would say that your first line of defense, your first line of you know, um, where you should put your money would be the bullion itself, okay? It is the, 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 the safest, uh, it has the leverage, it, you, it's uh, very liquid, you, you, know, you can sell it instantly, and it has a role in your portfolio. The second line, uh, line of defense or inquiry, if you want to put it another way, would be the royalty companies. Now, uh, Franco Nevada, 100%. It, of all the equities, it is the safest in terms, and also it has as much, if not more, leverage to price as an operating company without having uh, the inherent risk that you have in mining especially with a Franco Nevada that has dozens and dozens of properties, it's a very diversified risk. The, if you really know what you're doing, I would say then you can delve into the gold equities. But I, I caution because even though I love gold equities and I'm involved in a number of them, in, um, I, I will say that, uh, you know, if, for example, a mining company has one asset. That is a very high risk. You, you suffer a country risk, you suffer mining risk, you suffer all kinds of risk that you're taking on. And you're thinking that, oh my goodness, like, you know, this thing could double, but you don't look at the risk. So single asset company, I don't like, okay? I really don't like. To me, it's like a portfolio. It's, it's like you would be betting all your money on one asset, on one stock. You would never do that. It's the same with mining. You have to diversify your risk. And if you want to you know, be exposed to uh, the gold equities, I would pit, pick the, the Newmont mining, the Agnico Eagle, the very large one. And if you really know what you're doing, you can go into the second tier company. As for the, the juniors, forget it. You know, you have to have the knowledge to get involved in them. Otherwise, 99% of them are going to lose your money. So, Pierre, let me ask you, and this question comes up a lot, too. And there's one of the questions that came in for you, which is, do you have a problem with owning uh, a gold ETF over, uh, say, getting bullion delivered? Is, is that, are you okay with owning, uh, say, a GLD or something in that line? I, I, absolutely. And it's really a question of size. Um, if you're going to have like, you know, $50,000, $100,000 in, uh, in gold, direct gold, gold, gold bullion, it, it might just be a lot easier to buy the ETF uh, for transaction purpose. You know, you can sell it, buy it. It's immediate. It's there. It's 100% back by a GLD, by a gold bricks in the London vault. You have total security. If you're going to own millions of dollars of it, I would say buy the gold itself and have it stored at your bank because it's just cheaper. Right. Okay. If you're going to, if you're going to end up owning gold for the next 10 years and you want to have like 10 million of it, just buy the physical of it and it's cheaper. Right. So let, uh, a question we had too for you came from, uh, what I know this is uh, this is relative because you're all over the world, but just in general, uh, the question was what 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 does it cost to mine an ounce of gold relative today? You know, just in general, uh, and maybe that's not a good question because you go everywhere in the in the world. But that that was the question. It's a very, actually it's a very good question, uh, Ted, because the uh, world uh, the, the the World Gold Council. Um, set up 
essentially standards by which all the gold mining company have to report so that we can figure out who's doing what. And if you look at the average cost of mining an ounce of gold today, the cash cost is around $750. And the all-in costs, including the sustaining capital and everything, is around $950 to $1,000. Okay, and so uh, having having said that, uh, the other question we had had to do with um, obviously we're we're using hypotheticals into the future here of the gold price, but it looks as though the question we had is that it looks as though if you have a royalty company, the leverage for the upside, let's say a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars upside in gold is really skewed to the, the royalty. It, it, would that be a fair statement? It, it is in a sense that if, uh, and I'll tell you why, if the gold price goes up, for example, by uh, $200 and you have a 5% royalty, the, you get 5% of the increase automatically. Now, if you're an operating company, you would think that your torque is gonna go up that much. The, what happened if you look at the 2004 to 2011, when the gold price went from essentially 350 to $950, a lot of people went into the gold stocks, the new of this world and whatnot, thinking that, well, you know, they are doing a hundred dollar margin at 350. They are going to be doing $700 margin at 900. But that's not what happened because energy costs went from $30 a barrel to 150. And 25% of the mining costs is energy. And the reality is that the margin did not change and the equities did not move at all. The, the, the price of the Newmont shares were the same in 2011 as they were in 2004. And yet the gold price had gone from 300 to $1,000. And so uh, along that line, uh, would you see, would you see uh, someone maybe for, I'm asking for people that are not as obviously knowledgeable as you are, but uh, to maybe have a balance of owning the bullion and then owning a miner or two or, or, or royalty. Would you say that'd be a nice balance? I guess is my question to you. Absolutely correct, Ted. That is my recommendation is if you're gonna have a, a portfolio devoted to gold, I would say do something like a third, a third, a third, or depending on your risk appetite, half bullion, half uh, royalty company, or you know, uh, half bullion, 25, 25%, 25% royalty, 25% equity. I think that is a very nice mix. And so if you look at uh, a graph that we will show here too, of uh, 19, uh, 19, uh, 2000, I should say, to 22, uh, it looks as though we're sort of setting up. And when you look at that, uh, Pierre, looks like that, uh, you know, we've been sort of stuck here for two years, maybe, or something like that. And uh, maybe we're ready for, uh, for some upside here. Yeah, I, the bull market, this bull market started in 2002. That was the ultimate bottom at uh, essentially $250. And we've had a pause between 2015 and 2019, like a four or five year pause in the bull market. And now we're on the next leg up, I believe, of the, the bull market. And so uh, a question came in, and I'm not really familiar with this, but uh, the question was, what is the progress in nanoscopic gold processing, which I'm sure most people don't know a lot about that. They, they thought Newmont had a program to do sort of called a, monoatomic gold, which I've never heard of. And I don't know that, uh, that that's something that, that you've ever looked into, but that was the question. Um, I think it has to do with exploration. Right. And uh, how do you find gold? I mean, I, I remember when I was uh, president of Newmont, we had a, a team of, uh, you know, really bright the PhDs looking at, can we, for example, sample the vegetation and uh, over areas uh, and out of that, can we trace gold in the vegetation and whatnot? Um, it's proving to be incredibly arduous. And so far, nobody has found the, uh, the holy grail, if I can say that. I mean, we try, but that black box is still very black. Okay. Yeah. 
You know, uh, one of the questions we, we received as well was um, at times, and I know you've been around this a long, long time. So at times the miners do better than the bullion and at times the bullion does better than the miners. Is there a standard relationship or what, what do you think about that? It's, it's a very interesting relationship. And uh, what in the past uh, I've found is that the, the bullion always uh, comes ahead of the, uh, not the bullion, the equities are ahead of the bullion market. Mm -hmm. the, the equities sense when bullion's gonna turn and they tend to uh, run ahead of the, the bullion itself. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, the equities right now and they've been flat on their back for the past year. But lately, we're starting to see a return. So I'm thinking that, you know, you're going to see the gold price starts to come up again. So, uh, you know, you read a lot about price to cash flow on the, particularly the really larger companies that it's the best it's been in a long time. Do you see it that way as well on the miners? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, in fact, the, the ratios at which they're trading right now is ridiculous because the gold miners have never made so much money. I mean, in fact, all the mining companies are making records amount of money and they're trading for like four or five, six times cash flow. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. And it, it, you can almost, you know, uh, feel the, uh, I call it uh, the indifference, uh, you know, the, the market couldn't care less about the, the gold miners. And to my mind, that's the best time to actually acquire them and put them in your portfolio. Not only you're buying them at four or five, six times cash flow, but you're, you're getting like, you know, anywhere from two, three, 4% yield on them, which I find absolutely extraordinary. Well, they didn't in the past, you know, we didn't get the dividends like to pay today, but the really the large uh, companies are paying a nice dividend. Most of the, the really large traded companies and so, uh, well, that's really interesting. And I know you ran, I think I'm correct on this. Tell me if I'm not, but I think you ran, actually ran a gold miner stock fund for some 10 years, maybe. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, absolutely. What did you look for when you're owning those companies? What was your? You know, what I found, Ted, is that I made it, you know, the rule, the 80-20? Right. It, it applies everywhere. Okay. <laughs> so true. 80% of the return that I made came from actually less than 20% of the stocks that I own. Okay. And I try to prune the stocks as much as I could. And the lesson was when you have a winner, when you have a, a fabulous management team and a great asset, just buy more and buy more and keep it. And the ones that, you know, don't make it like prune them out, get rid of it, get rid of them. And uh, if I look back at the 80s, the stocks that made me money were Barrick when they discovered Gold Strike. Uh, they were uh, Newmont, you know, when they did acquire it, like all the Consolidate Nevada. They were uh, Agnico Eagle when they found uh, their mine in Quebec. They were, um, uh, what was it? Echo Bay. Echo Bay mine made a ton of money for me. Uh, for about a five-year period. And then they kind of went a little, you know, squirrely, so I sold the stock. But those were essentially the five companies that I, I probably made 80 or 90% of all the returns over 10 years. Interesting. Uh, Pierre, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step aside here off gold because you have some really interesting points on copper and mm -hmm. what copper should look like and what should happen where you see it with the greening of America, uh, greening of electricity, that sort of thing. Could you say a little bit about copper? Uh, I'd love to. And um, what I tell people about copper is when you look at our civilization, uh, frankly, our entire civilization rests on copper. And I say that, you know, just to uh, make sure that people understand that without copper, we have no transportation, there cannot be cars, there cannot be boats, cannot be airplanes, there cannot be any trucks, any, uh, any transportation of any kind, uh, because copper is the vital role that makes these, uh, you know, thing work. Without copper, we have no communication, we have no cell phone, we have no, you know, uh, tablets, we have no computers, we have, um, and then we, without copper, we have no elevators, we have, uh, no air conditioning, okay? So 
the, the more you think about it, copper is used so widely and we don't think about it because it's always there, it's always available. But what's changing is with the greening of the world, what, what the, the politicians want you to do, want the world to do, they want to you know, remove the hydrocarbon and go more with you know, green environmental uh, method to you know, use energy because we use more and more energy. The more energy we use, the more our civilization flourishes. That's, it's a very, it's, you know, energy is life at the end of the day. Today, 76% of terminal energy is hydrocarbon and only 24% is electricity. If we want a green world, we have to flip that around. We have to go to 76% electricity. Well, where are you gonna get the copper? Okay, that is the, that in a nutshell is the essentially the challenge that as a world we, we have. And those mines don't exist. We haven't even found them yet. So I look at copper over the next 20 to 40 years as a metal that will be forever wanted and where the price is going to range anywhere from four to ten dollars a pound and you know their cost of production is about a dollar sixty so the copper miners are making a killing these days they're all trying to find more copper but you know copper mines if you know uh, Franco Nevada is involved in, in the first quantum mine, Cobre de Panama, in, in Panama. Ted, the mine was found in 1966. Oh, wow. It produced its first pound of copper two years ago, and it costed $6.6 billion to build. Okay, these are the kind of time frame and money that you're talking about for copper mines. So you can imagine that even if you were able to find one today, now you have to, you know, drill it, you have to permit it. Like the permitting process today goes on for years and then you have to build it. Those are enormous enterprises. So this, the challenge of finding the copper that we need for the future is very real. And copper is used in all the, you know, all the green technology that we talked about uses more copper. An electric car uses three times more copper than a regular car, three times, right there. So the more successful that they are as selling electric cars, the more copper we need, period, simple, okay? So, so would you think, uh, I suppose the largest copper in the US would probably Freeport McMoran maybe or some? That's correct. Yeah. And then, uh, and re relative to copper, Pierre, is there a lot in North America? Yeah, copper, especially in Arizona. Uh, Arizona is a, a very, very large uh, copper producer. If it was a country, it would probably rank, I don't know, like seven, eight, nine in the world. Mm -hmm. It's a very large producing. Now, the, the king of all copper country is Chile. Okay, mm -hmm. Chile, Chile by itself produces 25% of all the copper. Interesting. And what about yeah. Canada? Canada it ranks, I think, uh, number seven or eight in terms of copper production. Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, what I think I understand is that this supply demand thing is going to really stay tight with copper for a long period of time. Correct. hundred yeah. percent. I want to close out with one question though, and it has nothing to do with metal. Um, I have always been enamored with uh, number one, your, your, your life, okay? But number two, um, your great ability, your philanthropic attitude and what you do. And I'm going to sign off if you would give people your advice on what it means to be philanthropic. Um, you know, look, I have been incredibly blessed in uh, this world. And to me, to give back is, a, is very meaningful. Seymour and I, my partner, we always say, the more we give, the more we get. And it has been so true to me anyway, and to him as well. The more we give, the more we get. And it, it's just a passion of helping, particularly young people. Um, at the University of Utah, where we created the uh, Entrepreneur Institute there, we give literally thousands of scholarships. And Ted, the letters that I get are just like, 
they truly go to my heart, okay, and the people that we help. And that's what it's all about. It's about, you know, the, if you look at the wealth of a nation, it's, it's young people. And if you are able to give them the means to become productive and to make a better world, that is the best thing you can do in life. Well, I thank you for those comments because uh, I think those are the good things in the world today that we need more of. But Pierre, uh, thank you so much. I know uh, we will have thousands and thousands of people watch this and probably have a lot of questions, but uh, thank you very much for being here. We hope uh, perhaps sometime in the future, we'd love to have you back if you would. So thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. It's been a true pleasure.